Hello, I'm Hannah Sachs, Editor-in-Chief of NEJM Evidence, and this is Stat Stat. You're waiting in line at your favorite bakery when you think, I wonder if I could make cookies mm. this good at home. Online videos make it look so easy, but you think about all the factors that go into making a good cookie. The amount of chocolate chips, the type of flour, the baking temperature. If you made batch after batch just changing one variable at a time, you would have to bake a lot of cookies to find the optimal combination. You also worry that the different choices might interact with each other. Does the number of chocolate chips change the best baking temperature? You're thinking it might be best to just wait in the bakery line when your stats textbook section on factorial design pops into your mind and you think, that's it. Maybe you can figure this out at home after all. In a traditional trial, one hypothesis is tested at a time. For example, does drug A reduce 30-day mortality compared to placebo? But with a factorial design, you might be able to test multiple hypotheses simultaneously using the same group of patients, or in your case, batches of cookies, and you can even test for interactions. Let's dive into a clinical example. Consider a trial that uses a 2 by 2 factorial design to evaluate the effects of drug A and drug B on 30-day mortality. In this trial, there are two independent variables, drug A and drug B, and two levels for each factor, receiving the drug or receiving the placebo. Participants then will be randomized to one of four conditions, drug A and drug B, drug A and placebo B, placebo A and drug B, or placebo A and placebo B. This design allows you to evaluate the effect of drug A, the effect of drug B, and whether the two drugs interact such that the effect of one drug differs in the presence of the other. If drug A had a main effect, it would mean that there was a difference in outcomes for the participants who received drug A compared with those who didn't, regardless of whether or not they received drug B. Assuming there are no interactions, you can compare the outcome of all those who received drug A with that of all those who received placebo A to estimate the effect of drug A. You can then do the same for drug B. This approach is more efficient than conducting two separate trials because you are using one sample to estimate two effects instead of conducting two separate trials with two separate samples. Now back to cookies. You decide to conduct a two by two factorial experiment. Factor one is the type of flour and it has two levels, flour power blend or batter up. Factor two is baking temperature. It also has two levels, 350 degrees or 375 degrees. The outcome is the gold standard of cookie quality, your friend's judgment of how they taste on a scale from 1 to 10. You assign your batches to each of the four conditions, get your friends to do the taste testing, and you see your data are clear. Looking at all the cookies baked with flour power, the mean score is 6.7 versus a mean of 7.7 for the cookies made with batter up. This suggests that there is a main effect for the type of flour on cookie quality. Similarly, you calculate the mean scores in both temperature groups and find that the 350-degree cookies have a mean score of 6.8 and the 375-degree cookies have a mean score of 7.6. This also suggests that there is a main effect of baking temperature on cookie quality. So far, we have assumed no interaction between the factors, but this may not be the case. When you graph cookie quality score versus temperature, you see that the batter-up cookies are always higher quality than the flour power cookies and both batter-up and flour power cookies received higher scores when baked at 375 degrees compared to 350. However, you notice that the flour power line has a steeper slope than the batter-up line. When batter-up cookies were baked at 375 degrees instead of 350, their score went up by half a point. But when the flour power cookies were baked at 375 instead of 350, the score went up by 1.2 points. Baking temperature is interacting with the type of flour. Had there been no interaction, you would expect parallel slopes. It's also possible for the lines to cross. That occurs when one factor has the opposite effect depending on the level of the other factor. You can imagine batter up is the clear taste winner at lower temperatures, but it leaves a burnt taste when exposed to higher temperatures. You could, of course, add a lot more factors. Number of chocolate chips, types of chocolate, cookie size. Remember, though, that the more variables you add, the more complex the design and analysis. With more factors, there are potentially more, and even interacting interactions. And that may be more thinking than you want to do about cookies. Time to enjoy them. Good luck, and happy baking.